Good morning, brothers and sisters. Would you please turn with me to Proverbs chapter 5 as we begin our worship together. Everybody awake and ready to engage what God's Word and allow God's Word to engage you? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Please stand. Oh. What I need for you to do is turn at least to a couple people that are next to you and remind them. Just look at them square in the face and say, hey, God loves what you're looking at. Go ahead. Somehow I thought that'd be a little more awkward than it was. (laughs) All right. Now that you're awake, you may be seated. Let's engage God's Word together. The title for the message today, the title for the sermon, is taken from a 1990s pop song. It is a, a song that those who were born into the greatest cohort ever known to mankind Gen X would know, and those after Gen X would say, I don't have any idea what you're talking about, and those before Gen X would say, we didn't listen to that kind of music. But perhaps you'll remember a group named TLC, and uh, they sang, really, what was a fascinating song, And, and I do mean that. But the song went something like, Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and the streams that you're used to. See, I know you're going to have it your way or nothing at all. I think you're moving too fast. The second verse of that song, the first verse of the song, was more about the mother and the son and the concern about growing up in in an urban environment where there was a lot of danger, and Mama was concerned for him, but he was going to do it his own way, his own time, make his own decisions apart from her, when really she just wanted to love him, and he didn't understand how much her love was trying to protect him and provide for him. The second verse becomes very brutal, I think. second verse is about this same kid, but he's tempted with a sin that is very normal. And he's tempted with this sexual sin with a particular young lady. And he's drawn to. But he's still going to make his own decisions. Nobody can speak into him. And they go on to say that a three-letter word is going to wind up taking his life. That word is sex. I'm pleading with you. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and streams that you know. If you were to listen to the rap in the middle, I by no means am saying that these folks are born-again believers. But this is another instance where we come into contact with something about the human conscience and the image of God in each person. We don't really give God His due, and I don't really think about His plan and purpose. My life seems like it's about, it's become, instead of anything being black and white, my life has become like ten shades of gray, and I pray that all ten shades would fade away. The turns of phrase in this song are 
are quite good. And the music itself is kind of cool. And yet it's sad. Because I know you're going to have it your way or nothing at all. But I think you're moving too fast. Ahead of God's will. Divergent from God's path and purpose, protection, and provision. So, this is a follow-up to last Sunday. And this one, kids, I want you to listen closely so that you can ask your parents all kinds of questions at lunchtime. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 5 beginning in verse 15. Please, drink water from your own cistern. Please, drink the flowing water that flows from your own well. Now, depending on what translation you have, verse 16 is either going to be stated negatively in the form of a question, English Standard Version, most modern versions, following the Septuagint as well. But if you're looking at a King James Version, following Vulgate or any authorized version, verse 16 is going to be stated positively. We'll get to that in a moment. I'm going to stick with the question as it is in the English Standard Version. Should your springs be scattered abroad? Should your streams of water be scattered in the streets? For those who are confused right now, we're not talking about water. Everybody in the house with me? Especially as you, as you think of the context of last week. Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Here's the intention. Let your fountain be blessed with God's abundant provision according to His intended purpose. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice. Just delight in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer. A graceful doe. These are good things, Robin. And it's biblical. You ever seen a pastor's wife become tremendously uncomfortable in a Sunday morning gathering? Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. What does that mean? Be intoxicated always with her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman? It's irrational. Why would you embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Please, son, remember. A man's ways are always before the eyes of the Lord.
And the Lord takes measure. And ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked, those are going to ensnare that person, even though they don't see it coming. And, and he becomes held fast in, in the cords of sin that continually take away his freedom and wrap him up in slavery. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he's led astray. And all people get to observe that life of folly. Ooh. Another very poignant teaching moment. We started this proverb with the king calling his son before him again and saying, listen, you've got, you've got to hear, you've got, you've got to embrace, you've got to receive this instruction in order for you to truly delight in God's wisdom. I'm pleading with you, as we've talked about, I'm pleading with you, son, prevention is better than intervention, and I'm trying to bring that up again. But then he called all of his sons together and said, you all need to listen. It's important for all of us. It's important for all of us as men. It's important for all of us as women. It's important for all of us as boys. It's important for all of us as girls. It's important for every one of us, but especially for those who name the name of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I made the comment last week, I'll make it again this morning, sexual sin is destroying the evangelical church in the United States of America. We have a tremendously sexualized culture in which we live, bombarded with it every day, many moments throughout the day. How are we to give ourselves to respond to it? And I want you to remember that the biblical text in a very real sense is saying, don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and streams that God has given to you. Maintain your sexual integrity and seek to maintain the sexual integrity of your neighbor as well. Please remember that when we studied the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, stated negatively as they are in the biblical text, thou shalt not commit adultery. Stated positively, you do everything. And God has given me as well the freedom to do everything within all the capacity God has given us. Do everything we can to maintain our own sexual integrity and the sexual integrity of our neighbor. There's great freedom in how to go about that. But positively, that's what we are to do. The boundary is do not engage in sexual activity with anybody outside God's provision and protection of a monogamous, heterosexual, biblical, permanent, loving, Christ-centered marriage relationship. Verses 15 through 17. I'm just going to, I'm going to give you a phrase that I gave to my son as I led him through Proverbs 1 through 9. Verses 15 through 17, one more time. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Here's the phrase. Don't, son, 
do not give yourself to common property. Do not give yourself to common property. Pastor, that sounds hard. I mean, that sounds harsh. But it does make the point that the biblical text is making. Can sexual temptation be real in the life of those who are genuinely attempting to follow Christ? I don't expect any hearty amens, but I imagine there's quite a few heartfelt, oh me, internally, from both men and women. But for young men and young women especially, and then everybody together, Don't give yourself to common property sexually. It wasn't God's design, and it's outside His bounds for a reason. We've already discussed some of those. There is inherent danger when you give yourself to common property. There are, as we saw last week, an allusion in verse 11, there can be deep health concerns when you give yourself to common property sexually. There are psychological concerns when you give yourself to common property. You minimize God's gift. You minimize God's sovereignty and rule. You minimize the lordship of Jesus Christ when you give yourself to common property. You devalue yourself and the other when you give yourself to common property. Pastor, are you talking about what do you mean by common property? I mean, when you give yourself to separate sexual intercourse from the intimacy that God had designed for that sexual activity, when you take it outside of the boundaries that God has established for your provision and protection, and you just see it as an activity, an act that's not that big of a deal when the Bible is saying continually it is a huge deal. When it just becomes an activity devoid of intimacy and the covenantal obligations within the context of a biblical marriage, You're neither looking out for the best interest of you or the other person. You are not enacting love. You are not making love. You are taking something that God made beautiful, rich, and intimate, and you're making it devoid of beauty its richness, and its intimacy. Common property, I can give my sexual energy to whomever I want, whenever I want to, and that person can do the same. I don't care. I don't care if it is prostitution where somebody has given themselves for money to other people and I participate in sexual activity with that prostitute. I don't care if it is somebody who engages with multiple sex partners, and I participate with that person, and I can participate, or if I'm the one who has multiple sex partners, and I can engage in sexual activity with all of them, it's not that big of a deal. It 
except that God says that it is that big of a deal. And he says you're destroying yourself and you're destroying others. The sexual activity outside of marriage, it, it does harm not just to the person with whom you're engaging in the activity, it does harm to those who are related and associated. Don't give yourself to common property. You, th- this is a gift that God has given to you that you should desire to cherish. Th- that you should desire to give. If God should bless and it's your desire to become married, that you would, you would give your sexual energy and capacity to that, that spouse as a, as a gift and they would do the same for you. That's the goal. Can we at least agree on that? that? That's God's good intention? Are we still in agreement with that? And we pray for one another because the over-sexualized culture in which we live, we're having competing worldviews. We're having competing thoughts. We're having competing arguments. And you can be faced with temptation day after day after day. Again, in our entertainment choices, in our workplaces, billboards, advertising. Don't give yourself to common property. Son, daughter, God wants more for you than that. He wants you to enjoy His good gift more than that. He wants you within a marriage relationship, a biblical marriage relationship, He wants you to use your sexual capacity for His glory. I'll tell you, this is one husband that says, hallelujah, God has some great ideas. Pastor, you can't say stuff like that up front. It's true. And if there's one thing I'm not afraid of, it's whatever's true. But to diminish God's gift and to turn it into something that is perverted from what he desired. To take our cues from our culture and take something that is to be pleasurable with intimacy in the heart of a marriage relationship and turn it into something that can be painful psychologically, physically in the midst of our culture. Son, why would you give up what is best? Why would you share one of God's greatest gifts that He has given to you to to offer to His greatest human gift that He will ever give to you? And I know some of you, if you're automatically thinking, well, uh, that's my kids. No, no. Ideally, God's ideal is this. Your kids and your grandkids, which are kind of cooler than your kids are, but they are, right? Yeah. Nicer, too. Anyway, your children and your grandchildren are simply a result 
of, outside of salvation in Jesus Christ, the greatest gift in human companionship that he has given to those of us who are married. My closest sister in Christ is Robin. More so than my daughter, more so than my granddaughters, more so than my daughter-in-law, more so than my mom, more so than my sister. Is everybody with me? She's my greatest sister in Christ. And I'm her closest brother in Christ. And, and God ordained in that marriage relationship for that sexual union to take place as a consummation. There's a reason we use that word for marriage relationships and the consummation of the marital vows. Consummation of the marital vows is the sexual relationship. Why? Because it is the bringing together of all that God has brought together in that couple. It is the consummation of the intellect. It is the consummation of the psychological, the social. It is the consummation of the relational. It is the consummation of the spiritual and a consummation then of the physical, where the two become one. And it's right and beautiful and good. When we understand what God's design for human sexuality is, I think it's easier to ask the question, why would I give myself to common property? Rather than the exclusivity of this one woman for all of my life. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to your own cistern. Stick to, water, stick to water that flows from your own well. Verse 16, as I said, if you're following the Septuagint or most modern translations, Negatively stating, should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Would you give yourself to common property? It, it's talking about promiscuity. Can you see? Why would you do that? Should you do that? Ought you do that? Is that God's design? Is it even best for you? No. You're giving away something that is intended to be beautiful and beautifully expressed with one other person. So let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers that you happen to be taken with in the moment. King James Version, the Vulgate and others, for the record, this, and I had to put Proverbs back in. This is my this is my Bible from my teenage years when I studied Proverbs 1 through 9. And it states it positively because the Hebrew really allows it either way. Chapter 5, verse 16 in the King James Version, if you has it, have it, says this, Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Well, how can those two very different things, the Hebrew language allows for, for both. But then if you went to verse 17 in the King James Version, let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. 
The point remains the same, whether it's placed negatively as a question stating the problem with promiscuity, or if it's stated positively saying, God, th this, this sexual integrity with your spouse, this sexual integrity is, is such that it's, it's not an isolationism. It's not, it's not something that God is trying to, to keep something good or withhold something good from you. In fact, the blessing of this marital relationship is seen in the blessing of family and integrity of those generations that follow and integrity to Christ so that they're put on display publicly, positively stated. So, again, verse 17, don't give yourself to common property. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Verses 18 and 19 and 20. Let your fountain be blessed. How? How about we do this? How about we spend multiple times throughout the day when those who are married in the congregation, when husbands get on their knees, whether that be physically or the posture of our hearts, get on their knees before God multiple times throughout the day and specifically state why we are so thankful for God's gift of our wife. It will change the whole feel of your relationship. It will cause you to pause before you see something that you wanted to be done and it's not done, probably because she's been doing about 50 million other things that needed to be done and you see that it's not done and you want to... No, give thanks. This is to be the closest sister in Christ that you have in your life. And she should be treated as the closest sister in Christ that you have in your life where we spend time in the day and in the evening pleading with God on behalf of our spouse that she would be all that she is supposed to be and that God would grace us with the ability to lead her lovingly, graciously, faithfully so that she could become all that she's supposed to be in Jesus Christ, socially, mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. That sounds a lot like Ephesians 5. Amen or no? And if our wives would have multiple times throughout the day, would they were, when they would get on their knees before God, whether that be physically or in the orientation of their heart, and give thanks to God and specifically state the reasons that they give thanks to God for the gift of their husband. Now, for Robin, it probably takes a little longer to come up with some things than it does for me with her. Before God and this whole assembly, they know it, and you know it. But publicly, one more time, I delight in you. No other woman, not before, not now, not ever. By God's grace, for His glory, for your flourishing, I love only you. A delight in. It's not to be a drudgery. It's not like it's supposed to be, well, we're, we're enduring the marriage. But God bless you, that just sounds sad. And I know that's where some are. But God designed marriage for more than that. I delight in the wife of my youth. Well, what, what do you mean? 
you can see, some of you have mentioned before, if I'm over here and I see my bride still walk through those doors right there, there's a smile on my face and my eyes still light up. Anytime when I used to go to sleep when I had surgeries, anytime that I come out of surgery, you know how you repeat things over and over and over again? My kids know this too. What do I repeat when I come out? I love you. Oh, I love you, Robin. I love you. Did I tell you I love you yet? I love you. Apparently, that's about all I say. Now, there's a trick to that. I repeat that over and over and over before they put the mask on and you go under. Because as a pastor, I'm going to be careful what I come out of it saying. <laughs> but it seems to be the thing, so if it works for you, do it too. Because Robin just rolls her eyes while all the nurses are going, aww. Yeah. And then the nurses treat you better for the rest of the time you're in the hospital. I don't know. Anyway, you delight in the wife of your youth. It is true that when Robin comes to the hospital, the nurses laugh because my heart literally skips a beat when she walks into the room. I delight in this woman. Yeah, but it's easy for you too. Okay. If it's easy for the two of us, then it's easy for you as well. Well, no, Pastor, you don't understand. It, it takes work. You think? <laughs> two broken, fallen, sinful human beings that God has joined together as one? trying to figure out how to live by the grace of God, for the glory of God together when you see everything about the other person? You have choices to make. Do I will to love this person or don't I? And you better understand what love means before you stand before God and a group of witnesses making covenantal obligations that you are not willing to keep. When I stood before Robin in front of about 350 people at our wedding ceremony, and I took her hands and I said, I take you. There wasn't any other hand that I was holding. It was just hers. And I said before God and everyone else, I take you, you only, you alone, I take you to be my lawfully wedded wife. While not saying these words, the intention of that was also to say this, in saying that I take you to be my lawfully wedded wife, I am proclaiming before God and the entire world and I am making a covenantal commitment to you that I am forsaking all others. This day, I am removing all other options and I commit myself to delighting in you. And by God's grace, it's been quite a ride. Delight in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer. A graceful doe. I realize that this imagery is particularly dangerous for bow hunters right now. Stick with what the biblical text is trying to say and don't shoot your wife, okay? <clears throat> Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Again, back to the sexual union. You delight in her in every way. 
and you give yourself to her fully. And wives, you give yourselves to your husbands fully with joy, honoring Christ in the consummation of that marriage relationship. I have to chuckle sometimes with, with people because we men, we're, we're, a special, we're a special breed of cat. Well, my wife, she just, you know, even physically she's not who she was when we first got married. Dude. Dude. Most of us men have a hard time looking in the mirror and actually seeing ourselves for who we are. Right? Because, yeah, you were that special catch. But by God's grace, wives, delight in your husbands with all of our idiosyncrasies. Even though we don't have all the capacities that we used to have, perhaps all the skills that we used to have, the minds that we used to have. Husbands, delight in the wife of your youth. in every way. And you maintain the purity. Hebrews says this, the fidelity of the marriage bed. There should only be two people in that marriage bed, husband and wife, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. There should not be anyone else in there instead of the other married spouse. There should not be anyone else in there in your minds. There should not be anyone else in there in the orientation of your hearts. That sexual union is a beautiful thing for your provision and protection in the biblical boundaries of God's design for a heterosexual, loving, Christ-centered, permanent, exclusive marriage relationship. When you know what God's design is, why would you give yourself to be intoxicated by common property? Why would you give up something that is enduring for the long term in a beautiful way for something that is a short term, physically pleasurable, that can destroy you? Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and streams that you know. Delight in the wife of your youth. Verses 20 through 23, 21 through 23. Simply saying this Your ways are known by God, and your end will be seen by all. Don't ever forget, even in the darkness, and what you believe to be the, the privacy of a sexual union, all things are in the presence of the Almighty God. As He weighs our actions and our sins entrap us, And the funny thing about sin or difficult thing about sin is that when we sin once, even perhaps in a smaller area, it's very easier, it's much easier to take that next step and sin again. 
We become further desensitized to it and we sin again. The cord wraps around us. And we don't even notice that the ability we had with our freedom to speak against and yell against and hold against that sin, it, it's being taken away from us. And maybe if it was just one or two chords, it, it's easier to break through those by the grace of God and say, never again, I repent and I want to follow Christ and He will forgive, amen? And, and I can do that, but then we continue in this sin and the chords keep wrapping again and again and again. Do you see the image? And now this man and now this woman, they're, they're entrapped, they're enslaved. The energies that I had to fight against this sin, by the grace of God, it becomes much more difficult because I'm entrenched. My mind, my mind has been given to think default patterns that are contrary to the revealed will of God, and it's hard to undo that. My decision-making has been given to default to patterns of choices that are contrary to the will of God and these cords of sin have tied me up. I'm not thinking straight. I'm not thinking right. I'm not, I'm not thinking about the glory of God. I'm not acting according to the will of God. I'm, I'm not making the moves that need to be made in order to honor God and I know it and I don't feel like I can do anything about it. I'm stuck. The cords of that person's sin will enslave them. And we die for lack of discipline. And in that great folly, our path of being led astray in sexual sin, eventually it's on display for all to see. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Stick to the rivers and streams that you're used to. By God's grace, I pray that you're not going to have it your way or no way at all. Because what is best for you, son, daughter, is God's way. He's designed it for your provision and protection. May all those who name the name of Christ have great resolve great conviction of heart to say, I will not, by God's grace and for God's glory, I will not sexually sin against God or other persons with my mind, with my heart, with my body. I will do everything I can to protect my own sexual integrity and the sexual integrity of of my neighbor. By God's grace and for His glory, I will not chase waterfalls. I will not give myself to common property. I will delight in the wife, the spouse of my youth, because I know all things are seen by God. And the life that He has redeemed, I want Him to be pleased with. I really do. And I know, again, in preaching a sermon like this, there are some in the congregation whose hearts are utterly broken. Because I talked about the cords of sin, and that's where you find yourself right now. Enslaved and trapped, and I don't know what to do. I don't think Christ can forgive me because of where I am in the sexual sin in my life. 
let me speak to you with great joy. In the only one that I delight in, far greater than my wife. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. who is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we will acknowledge our sexual sin as sexual sin against God and the other. And the others. Not only will he forgive and make clean, he will restore the joy of his salvation that he graciously has given to you in his son, Jesus Christ. The Father stands ready to say, I have already forgiven you through the shed blood of my son, Jesus, your Lord and Savior. And by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit that I give to every one of my children, I have given you all that is necessary for you to be set free from the bondage of sexual sin. You need, you must seek accountability. Men with a godly man who is following Christ that you can trust. Women with a godly woman who is following Christ whom you can trust. If you do not know who that is, Please talk with me. Please talk with Pastor Paul. Please talk with one of our deacons because we would love to point you to a brother or sister in Christ here in the fellowship of Calvary Baptist Church that would absolutely delight in being able to tell you of how you can be freed from the bondage of sin, sexual sin in particular, and have accountability as we see God free us as a people for his name's sake. We are in the world, but we are not of it. God saved us to live holy lives, consistent with the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was imparted to us. Yes, you can be forgiven. And yes, prevention is still better than intervention. Amen? We're going to give ourselves to worship and song by giving thanks to God for the grace that He's offered in Jesus Christ. And the reality, praise team, you can come forward. And the reality <clears throat> that as we even confess our sexual sin, the blood of Jesus speaks for us even in the midst of that sin. If you embrace the Son, you can be set free fully and completely. Father, please continue to work in the hearts and minds of your people this day. We pray, Father, that even as we worship in song that the Holy Spirit would work in us in order